Welcome to Conversations with Doc Martin. This video series focuses on extraordinary people doing extraordinary things. Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click notifications so you don't miss out on our next guest. Today we're joined by Wesley Hamilton, who's transformed from victim to victor. Gunshot wounds left Wesley with a spinal cord injury, and then he turned to fitness and nutrition and became inspired and empowered. Wesley drew inspiration from his roles as a father and potential role model and went on to establish a philanthropic organization called Disabled But Not Really, whose mission is to bring positivity and hope to the disabled community and beyond. He's won bodybuilding competitions, philanthropic awards, and some even say the hearts of the world. Wesley transformed yet again when working with the Fab Five on season four of the Netflix hit show Queer Eye. Wesley shares that the Fab Five taught him how to be true to himself and he was humbled by the experience. Wesley believes that the highest human act is to inspire, and this is his purpose in life. He works hard to deliver motivating messages on the power of self-love, resilience, and change, trying to make waves in the world. So Wesley, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me, Doc. It's an honor. Um, appreciate the intro. Um, yes, yeah, just any ability to share my story, which you just did an amazing job on. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you for having me and thank you for creating a platform that inspires people to share their stories and empower others to start to heal from theirs. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm aware that one of your favorite quotes is uh, be the change you wish to see in the world uh, that is attributed <laughs> to Gandhi. And so boy, oh boy, ha are you bringing change into the world? And, you know, we ended up uh, meeting each other virtually. Uh, we have a mutual friend, uh, Jeff. Uh, who's one of my coaching buddies. And we'll get into that a little way later. It was kind of odd. I was watching your episode on Queer Eye. And at the end, they have this big party fundraiser. I'm like, what is Jeff doing here? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we ended up getting connected. And so- Jeff had the most perfect cameo at the end, right? He does. He, he does. does. He's like- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I love Jeff. Jeff is, Jeff is an amazing guy. He has an amazing story. And, and I'm- I'm so blessed that he's in my life and he brought us together and, and he's doing amazing things as well uh, in his coaching practice. And so, look, Wesley, you, you have had such a journey, such an inspiring journey. And I was watching Queer Eye. I was watching some of your other interviews. I was watching your TED Talk. And one of the things that, that I hold most dear is the reality that we are our own best cheerleaders and we are our own enemies. And what can cause one thing or another is like what's between our ears, right? And so share with uh, the audience, if you would please, kind of your story and, and, and particularly, you know, that, that time when you, were, when you were bedridden and you really had these negative thoughts and how you started to turn things around. Yeah, you know, um, I think it's good. Today is an amazing day to even share it um, just because yep. uh, the beginning of the year is always one of my troubling times, you know, and just, um, yeah, so point being is that I just celebrated my rebirth yesterday. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy that this is kind of the question, but yeah, so let me take you there, right? I can always tell people like, in order for you to know who I am, you have to know who I used to be, right? Like, and sure. you have to understand like that journey. But, <laughs> all right, so I'm, I'm 33 years of age, uh, born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri, um, east side of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and so I speak about just really, I can sum up my life real quick as a, a, a youth, as an adolescent by saying that I was a product of my environment. Mm -hmm. There was no, there was no, um, role models or positive representation in my community. So the things that I did fell into, you know, a lifestyle that really I, I believe was designed for people like myself, as we are starting to see coming into new times and new eras, you know, of systematic changes that has, you know, defeated communities. So with that being said, um, at the age of 24, um, I was shot multiple times. I literally had just turned 24. Five days after my 24th birthday, I was shot multiple times, which led to me having a spinal cord injury um, from the waist down. Well, at this time of my injury, well, let me start. Because of the lifestyle that I lived mm -hmm. and the mindset that I had, you know, I accepted the fact that when I got shot, I was going to die, right? Like, I didn't wow. see myself 
advancing from that. I probably was more uh, mad that I did, right? Like, because I had to live something new. Um, right. And I was so used to a life that was designed. That meant that the lifestyle that I live, I was either going to die or go to jail. You know, and so, you know, being shot, no matter what the issue was, it seemed like it was my reality, right? Like, it seemed like it was supposed to happen to me, but it, it didn't. I didn't die. I woke up. And, you know, I always tell people, like, I woke up and it was a whole new world for me. You know, it was a whole new life because it was something that I, you know, waking up in a hospital and finding out that you you were paralyzed from the waist down from, you know, um, things that, you know, you really don't want to accept on your own, right? Like, you don't want to take accountability for it. You want to blame it on others. So, like, you're sitting there and you're going through all this self pity um i just had a conversation with someone earlier so we was talking about imposter syndrome right so like yes. when i could think about it i think about just like i woke up with this imposter syndrome because i was a part of a community that i really never really knew nor was it really presented to me in such a powerful positive manner so i really saw myself falling right back into a trap that i thought getting shot was getting me out of Right. Like I, I thought, you know, being shot was going to get me out of the 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 lifestyle that I was living, you know, and, and yeah. So being, you know, here I am with this disability. But on top of that, I'm 250 pounds. I'm only five, five, you know, and I'm, I'm overweight. I've always been overweight my whole life. So it wasn't an issue until I got in a wheelchair. Sure. And, and for me, because I've never had someone teach me how to really take control of my life, hold myself accountable. I was looking for a way out in this process, right? Like, so um, being, you know, so I always tell people my first year of my injury, I went back to what I knew, you know, I tried to go back into the lifestyle that I knew. Um, I, I believed I was a leader in my community, but I also believed that I was a follower because I didn't lead people out of my community. I felt like I just let them still inside, right? Like I, I might've, had a little bit of power or in my mind, but it wasn't leading people to something better. You know, so for me, when I went backwards, see, I mm -hmm. did go backwards. I, I went backwards, it hurt me more than um, going forward and taking and accepting what was happening to me. So by my end of my first year, I had a pressure ulcer on my tailbone. And so, um, and this is caused by just sitting too long for hours at a time. And of course, like, that imposter syndrome came in. I wasn't, I couldn't accept something where I didn't feel accepted, yep. right? Like this was a community. This was something that I wasn't used to. Everything had changed. My body had changed my pain. You know, it was just like, it was so much easier to hate the world for who I had become instead of embracing who I was and being okay and starting to move the world in a different way, you know, through perspective or anything. Instead, it was like, oh, no, I just, I, you know, I hated it. So that led to two years of bed rest, six surgeries. Um, I, you know, for a year I had a colostomy bag. So like that, that bothered me um, just because it, it was, uh, it was temporary. So I always tell people like, you know, you tell me I only got it for three months and it goes for a year, you know, now I have self-conscious issues. Sure. What happened was this process made me realize how debilitating it is for the disabled community in the world, because it wasn't something that like, you know, it wasn't like, hey, man, you're going to go live this life despite your circumstances. It's like you got these circumstances and because, you know, the world already sees you as limited. Now everything around you constantly still feels like more limitations being thrown on top. You know what I mean? From the bed mm -hmm. rest, from, you know, the challenges. Rather, it was like I had to wait two, three weeks to get a wheelchair. So I had to sit in my bed, you know, lay in my bed till I got one. You know, it was all those things that transpired to the point of me realizing like, in order for me to live my life the way I really want to live my life, I have to accept this life. Yeah. You know, because what I realized is that only way that you can have better is when you accept what you have right now. Absolutely. And, you know, accept the moment, fall in love with the person you are. And of course it was hard, but it was that realization that nobody around me, none of these systems around me was going to give me what I was seeking. It wasn't going to give me that positive push to say, man, despite not being able to walk, you can still walk. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know but what I mean? It, it, it's amazing 
to to hear your story in this conversation and and I don't think I'll ever forget one of the things you said in your TED talk where you were talking about representation and role models and 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 a lot of what you're sharing is is looking to role models and, and trying to have to carve your own way. And and you said, you know, if you can't find somebody around you that's the role model, you have to be the role model. And and your your whole discussion of imposter syndrome, it's such a it's such a humanistic trait. And, and there's people like you that have such amazing, I don't know if amazing is the right word, but incredible challenges that, that end up rallying. And then when you think about it, it's like everybody gets stuck between their own ears, right? <laughs> and That's so, very much so, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely, completely. And so, so tell us about some of the, well, you were sharing the, the, the kind of timeline and 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 the starts of the turning point for you from yep. a from a mental perspective. So you know, I always I always start with my struggles before I tell people like you know my you know it's a seed. It was a seed yeah. planted into my life before um, I really knew what that seed was, and I was my daughter. Um, you know, two two three months before my accident, I had just got sole custody of my daughter, and she was a mm -hmm. year and a half. And um, and of course, like. Uh, I won't go in depth of why I have so custody of my child, but um, I believe like certain things are just there for us. You know, that whole process, didn't know that I was going through a process to have this, this, um, this human being yep. in my home while yep. I went through this transition, right? Like I yep. didn't understand it at the that moment, Yeah, but it's like it was a seed planted because I was living a plan that was already destined for me. Mm -hmm. Right, like, and so, like, that's what I started to realize. So, let's go back. All right, so we talk about the surgery, we talk about all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And the turning point was that even though I was going through all these surgeries, and I got to a point where they was giving me it was 21 hours of bed rest a day, Oof. and I, I, I could only get up for three hours a day. I fell in love with two things. The doctor told me that the only way I would heal is adding protein to my diet because mm -hmm. of my pressure ulcer and the wound, the type of wound it was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know nothing about um healthy eating you know i'm coming from a community where there are food deserts right like and so right. we eat what we can i think i'm queer I, I told somebody i said i think i was like a double quarter pounder with cheese right yes like, i remember that that was that, that was my go-to meal right <clears throat> and I, um I, i'm a thank you for uh you know, I always tell people like I Wesley Hamilton is McDonald's free for about nine years. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I always try to do my little, you know, my little pack, let people know I, I'm done with that. You know, I'm yeah. over. But what happened was because I could get out three hours a day, this come where determination and will, right? Like I'm a single father. I'm defeated. I'm defeated. When I say defeated, I mean, I hated myself. Suicidal thoughts. Like I didn't want to be here. I didn't this was a, a, a figure, a person that I couldn't accept who I was, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I couldn't accept this. And so because of that, I had to seek it different. And what I realized was like, as a man, mm -hmm. as a man, I took responsibility of my child despite anything. I brought the child to my house. Well, what am I doing by being defeated by my circumstances? What am I teaching? Right. And so in my mind, it was like, I want to see better. I want to do better. But how bad do I want it? Right. Yeah. Like, and I think it was just that it was me seeing her and saying, OK, let me try to be stronger. And having that will to try motivated me to go to a community college, take up a dietitian course um, for a year and a, for about a year and a half. I learned how to eat healthy. You know, I was Amazing. I picked up a book on nutrition. I always tell people it started with Dr. Pepper. So Dr. Pepper was my favorite drink until mm -hmm. I opened this book up, this nutrition book, because like maybe page five, it starts showing you how much sugar was in cans, 20 ounces, stuff like that. I'm and they did it by cube. And I'm like, man, when I seen that cube, I'm like, I would never put that many cubes in. <laughs> like, I would never. And so I started drinking water, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I was shot January 14th, 2012. My last surgery was January of 2015. Okay. So that's why I love my timeline because everything was in January. It was January. My yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. 
um, so January 2015, so three years later, right? So um, practicing uh, nutrition, trying to be stronger for my child, being on bed rest for two years, like all of this happened, but by January 2015, I get in a hospital bed. Now, mind you, in this whole transition, I'm in denial. I mean, right. I'm, in a, I'm in a wheelchair. There's no scale that I can hop on. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I, I was wearing size 44 jeans before I got in a wheelchair. Wow. You know, so now I'm like in a 36, but they baggy, but I'm still in the now. I'm like, this ain't real. You know, like I'm gonna get bigger. Well, then I get on this hospital bed and they like, you're a hundred and I think I was 135 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Brian, I don't even remember when I was a hundred anything. Right. You know? And so that, that like really empowered me to say like, man, I'm, I, I mean, I, I have limited mobility, but sure. I had a will to do something that I believe could happen because I had something bigger in my life that I didn't have to really focus on me anymore as much as I needed to focus on her and her ability to see that she could rise through any levels of adversity, right? Like, Absolutely, and, and one of the things you also said, I told you I was listening. I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, you made the comment several times and I believe in several different um, situations that your, your beautiful daughter saw her dad. Yeah, yeah. Didn't see a guy in a wheelchair. And I thought that was such an amazing metaphor, not just for the disabled, but for everything. Like people of, cover, people of color, sexual orientation, gender identity, everything. And your daughter is a smart young lady. No, seriously. Um, I, I remember that day of it really being impactful. I think I was just in a hospital and... Um, you know, I did a lot of spending time in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just remember it was a time when I got in my chair and she was like, oh, that's your Superman chair. You know, and I'm like, you know, I always tell people like, I like Batman. I'm a Batman person. <laughs> <laughs> a Batmobile or something. You know? <laughs> but um, it was it was at that moment that I, I knew that she saw strength that I didn't see myself having, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, ah, oh, I gotta be Superman. But it also was that moment that I realized like, when you, you know, I, the imposter syndrome, my defeats from in life had came from worrying about how people saw me. Yeah. You know what I mean? As a black man growing up, like I probably would have risen above so much if I didn't care about the stereotypes and the things that was already portrayed. Mm -hmm. And instead of falling into them and embodying them, what if I said, forget what you see of me, I yep. can be more, right? And yep. so this was my position where it was like, I was rising above some adversity that I didn't know how to rise above, but because I got strength from my child of not seeing me, how I felt that the world saw me. Absolutely. But, you know, but saw more in me, you know, and, and it goes back to like, you know, um, I do a lot of reading now, I'm an avid reader and I, it goes back to like a book that I was reading in uh, Napoleon Hill and um, it's mm -hmm. called How to Own Your Own Mind. Yes. Um, and one of the things is just talking about leaders, right? Like, and I feel like my daughter has carries leadership traits because it said leaders see good in everything and everybody, yeah. and you see strength and you believe in the courage that people have, even if they're not presented in front of you that day. Yep. You know what I mean? And so like, for me, it was like, man, you seen something in me that I didn't see. Isn't and that amazing? Now, now what five, let's see, 2015. So six years later, my my legacy has been created because of that. That's incredible. And, and it's it's amazing because it's it's that innocence that that shows us the real way, right? Because we we as adults, regardless of our circumstances, we we get trained. We allow ourselves. Let's put it that way. How about that? We allow ourselves to get trained by our circumstances, and and we see the world many many times and in many circumstances through the lens of what we think everybody else is seeing, right? Mm -hmm. And so for, for us to be our individual Superman or Batman, by the way, I don't know if you know, in Phoenix, I, I, think, I hope it's still there. There's an actual bat cave and a Batmobile. I don't know if you know this. So if you ever come, if you ever come, we're going, man. Uh, yeah. And I've seen the Batmobile in person. It's insane. It's amazing. Anyway, but, but it's, it's almost like what you found you know, forget about the Superman and Batman for just a second. It's almost like you found your armor, right? Yeah. And yeah. your strength came from within. And people have such a hard time 
finding their armor or maybe even to go with the analogy, putting their armor on because they have that imposter syndrome in, in their brain. Yes. And, um, you know, you, you've turned this positive mindset in, into helping others. And so I, I, you know, I know we're going to get there. I'd love for you to share all about your foundation and, and how that came about. What you oh, No, seriously. So that's, that's the next thing, right? Oh, cool. they, like literally they tell me I lose weight. They yeah. tell me I lost this weight in a hospital bed. I was doing my last surgery. I had six weeks of healing on a specialized bed called a clinitron bed, made mm -hmm. out of sand. But by this time, I am literally focused on healing. I'm like, I don't care. I'm going to lay on my stomach for this whole six weeks. I got my own refrigerator in there because I'm eating healthy. I'm doing all this good stuff, right? But yeah. what I realized at that time was that I had never in my life seen someone with a disability feeling or looking as like, as positive and as happy about their limitations as I was at that moment. Yeah. And even though I was in a hospital bed, I know at that, I know at that time that I realized that a lot of my defeats were because of the representation that I saw. And even mm -hmm. though like, you know, people with disabilities, you don't see them out in the community as much. So where do you see them? Normally at the hospital on a, maybe a bus stop, yeah. you know, or you might see them at the grocery store, but the ones that you see might not be in shape. They yeah. might be dealing with something. They might be depressed. They might be quiet. And so for, for me, I didn't feel none of that no more. That's amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I didn't, I was, but I was still in a hospital bed. So I started looking up how to how to change people's lives. Mm -hmm. I said, man, I wanted to create something that helps people with disabilities be more active and healthy because the courage that I grabbed from my daughter helped me understand what I really wanted to do with my life. And, and I gained, found strength out of that. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just, I started, you know, I had my laptop. So I started just doing logos and things like that and came and I hashtag disabled, but not really on a picture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, just all my family and friends was going crazy. Like, oh man, it's so cool. Yeah. And that's dope hashtag. And so I was like, all right, this is a thing. And so I registered as a nonprofit. Um, and so of course I didn't have no, you know, awareness of really what I wanted to do. I was just motivated by changing other people's lives from the things that changed mine. Sure. Like I, I didn't want to go into anything else. Like I wasn't really into the gym or anything yet because mm -hmm. I had just got out of off a of bed rest. All mm -hmm. I knew is that my body changed from eating healthy. And mm -hmm. that was powerful. I wasn't on yeah. meds anymore. I wasn't doing any of this stuff. So I started, I started going out and looking for expos that were in our in in the country, you know. So their thing called ability expos. Mm -hmm. And so I just started going to them. I went by myself. I started traveling alone. Like I went through three years of like sitting in a bed defeated. So sure. I wasn't free, right? Like yeah. I had literally push myself from self-imposed limitations, right? Like all those doubts and things that I had in my mind, I, was, I had overcame them. So I'm like, uh, let me go out here. Let me <laughs> what I did, man. I found a community of people, not only just like me, but people of all different ability levels doing amazing things despite their limitations. And yeah. it blew my mind of a community that was already out here, but yet society has not shown the world, yep. right? Right, and I'm like, you know, they're like, oh, have you heard of CrossFit? Have you heard of wheelchair bodybuilding? I'm like, what? No. <laughs> I started doing my research. And by January 2016, here go the timeline again, mm -hmm. I'm back jumping the gun, starting to compete. So 2016 was my first year of competitions. And by, you know, for the next three or four years, I'm competing in bodybuilding and CrossFit, winning awards all over the country, getting featured in Men's Health Magazine. Like That's all nice. these things happen where, this young black man that came from a community that only hoped and wished that, you know, believed that he Absolutely. would be dead by the age of 21. The moment I took control of my life, I started to make things happen for myself that actually opened me up to the world, right? Like I have, I've been stuck in my community for so long that me traveling, you know, traveling here, traveling there, competing, yep. giving, giving people that might have only saw me in a certain view from what society portrays, something yep. completely different. And it was amazing. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. because I did all of that, I knew exactly what I was going to do with disabled, but not really. Right. Like I came back, like I had to, you know, if anybody asks, like, what is disabled, but not really? I'm like, it's me. 
Yeah. You know, I that. Like if you look at my journey of how nutrition changed my life and it fed me to go into the gym and then that made me a competitor, but I wasn't in competition with nobody else but myself. You got right. it. I was yep. literally pushing myself every day because I wanted to celebrate my wins because I had never celebrated myself. Exactly. You know what I mean? And like, despite who I am now, I was completely okay with it. That's incredible. <laughs> and, and I love what you described because what I think what so many people miss, wherever they are in life, whatever their circumstances are, you just got to get started. And so what you were describing was, you know, the whole timeline of, I made the decision, I started eating right. I started going to these events. I, I decided to compete in a bodybuilding competition without any assumptions other than competing with myself. And, and just one thing leads to another. And, and you know, it's funny in, in one of my other interviews, uh, ironically enough, another buddy from my coaching program that Jeff knows, Sean Swarner, here, here's a dude that had two cancers before he was 18 and climbed Mount Everest with one lung. Mm. And, um, and I was talking to him about some of our own, uh, some of the conversations he and I had. And he looked at me and he goes, look, I'm really humbled that you shared that with me, but you know, everybody has their own challenges. And, and you know, because he climbed Mount Everest, what he said to me was everybody has their own Everest. Mm. And you know, it, it, it just starts with that first decision to kind of go forward. And so that's one of the reasons why I was kind of so drawn to you because you just, you made the decision and you started and, and where you are today is not where you were in 2015 or, or before that, right? It was, it was a whole stepwise progression. You know, every day is a journey for me. And, I, you know, it's the book that I read. It, um, it says something like the man, and of course, this is just an analogy, right? But it mm -hmm. was like the man that wants to uh, get from poverty to riches, right? It's like the farmer that uh, wants to um, transform a forest <laughs> to a productive field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meaning that it's a journey. And like, and when you go on this journey, you don't find yourself chasing the riches as much as you find yourself chasing yourself. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Like, and, and once you chase yourself, you're, the things that you're manifesting for a better life, for a better version of you, the thing, you, it starts to fall in two, right? Like Absolutely. it starts to come, but it's all about the awareness of yourself and the awareness that it's a journey. We can we won't be who we are vision being unless we work for it but we yeah. have to work for that person every day like there's no way that i'm content with who i am today let me rephrase that there's no way that i won't go tomorrow pushing myself to be a better version thinking that i was content with who yeah. i am today because like I, I will embody the person i am because i will be satisfied with who i am if this was my last day Right. But I have the opportunity to open my eyes up again. I will see myself as being better than the person I fell asleep as. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I, I, I love, it's just so incredible. And, you know, when I was watching Queer Eye again last night, you know what I observed about you? Every single shot with, with a couple exceptions, which we'll get into, there was the biggest smile on your face. <laughs> I have ever seen. And, you know, I was watching it again, knowing that we were going to talk, of course. And I'm thinking to myself, I've got to ask him the question. How, tell us about the joy that you experienced during that, because it just, it, it flooded from the screen. It was incredible. <laughs> um, you know, I think it was, I think it was a lot of things, right? Like, you know, I'm happy with the person I am and I'm happy with the person I've become. Right. But also like, I'm happy that I have a willingness to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. The beauty and power of working with others that I would never have saw myself with. Sure. And like me, like being on that show, you know, or just being in that, I was around free men. Right. You know, I always tell people that like, you know, you when you're judging people, that's because you have your own issues with yourself. Yep. You know, because once you realize that you're a work in progress, you can never judge somebody for where they are today if you believe that they could be better tomorrow. You got it. Right. And so, like, for me, I was around men that were trying to not only empower people like myself, they were happy doing it. Yeah. You know, like, it was like they had figured out what makes them happy. 
And so now they can go and help other people. And that was it. We, when you move with love, right, it creates empathy. Absolutely. And, you know, and what I was surrounded by was empathy and integrity. Yes. Right? Everybody was doing good just because it felt good. It wasn't like, oh, I had to do it. Like everything that have to transpire, transpire the way it did. Yep. You know, they poured into me as much as I poured into them. And so on and off the screen, there was so much love being poured out that it exhilarated every time you seen me. You yeah. Know, like everybody's like, oh, man, what's the smile? I'm like, but you just don't know how amazing I feel in a space that mm -hmm. I don't see many people like me in this space. That's amazing. And, and, and you know, each of them, they've all been interviewed quite a, quite a bit. And one of the things I really like about each and every one of them is, and you said it, they've all had their own challenges that they've overcome. They've all been very public about it. You know, you had a moment with Tan on camera when you were talking about coming out and if I may be so bold, you assuming that he was out earlier than that, and he shared with you it was just before Queer Eye came out on on screen. And I was I was thinking about my own coming out journey. I was like, whoa, that that I mean, I had heard that before, but but to see the, um, I guess you could say the pain on his face that 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 you kind of brought out. I mean, each and every one of them is is really you know being true to themselves, as as you've said, right. That's cause, um, that's our that's because our strong friends need love too sometimes and true. you know some people call me um <clears throat> some i get people call me things all the time but positive things um mm -hmm. empath right like yeah. and so like, like for me i felt like i already knew what i was going to ask 10 because i could feel it inside of him mm. and like for me like I, I, I truly like, as he's talking to me <laughs> and we're talking, I'm like, I'm so curious of why am I around somebody free like you? And like, even though he had his issues and his trouble and that he shared, right. And he even broke down. It was like the moment that he broke that fear to come out is the reason why he was able to be himself at yeah. that moment. Yeah. And like, even though it was recent, it was like, maybe that's the reason why that energy felt so good that I needed him to put it out right then. Right. Like, yeah. because it was like, he was more free. He was, could have been flying if you gave him the chance. Right. Like right. that's how good it felt. And I'm like, hold on. Right. Like I need <laughs> to ask something because this is the world needs to know. Like I always believe in like that subconscious mind and that way of thinking. And so honestly, I just feel like that was like my mind saying like, listen, this is something that the world needs to know, need to, understand that these people are human that's amazing and, and that if they're human that they went through something and, and sometimes us as being strong like you see yeah. me now, right some people will see my strengths and they they won't see my weaknesses and so to have like conversations like this will let people know that i'm human too absolutely and and you know i'd love to talk to each and every one of them mainly because it, it, it so fits with with everything that I hold dear and, and what I'm trying to do on this channel because they all have their unique things. You know, Bobby struggle with, you know, religion and Anthony struggle with with anxiety and, and it goes on and on and on and, and what Karamo has been through and, and how they've all kind of basically created and I'm going to I'm going to air quotes this created <laughs> success in their lives. But, you know, at the end of the day, success is what anybody feels that it is. Right. It, it's not. It's, it, it's never, even though society thinks it is, it's never monetary stuff. It's never fame. It's like success at its core is, is whatever it means for you, right? And so they're, I think they're just amazing men that, that are really bringing joy into the world and, and challenging people to think differently. And you, know, you, 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 you use the F word, fear. And that's one of the things I like to talk to you about because on the show, you face the man who shot you. Yeah. And what, I, as I was thinking about talking to you about this specific subject, you know, what came to my mind, it was kind of like, not only did you face your psychological fears and got up out of that bed to use a metaphor, mm -hmm. but you physically faced your fear. Like you're the manifestation of your fears was right in front of your face. <laughs> and, and so you, you did both. And so, oh my gosh, like I, I remember sitting there again, watching it again last night, thinking to myself, 
how many people can't even get out of their own way in their head and you not only got out of your way in your head, but you, you, you literally faced a physical manifestation of that. So tell us about that experience. You know, all right. <clears throat> the crazy thing is that I'm a, I'm a firm believer of affirmations, right? Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a firm Me believer too. of affirmations. If people want to know why did I get to where I am, it's because I started to tell my thing, myself things that I could believe, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and so one of the biggest affirmations I would share was that he tried, the man that tried to take my life gave me life. I always said that because, you know, you have to get to a point where the, the thing that I think society has a problem with is taking accountability yeah. of our actions, right? Yeah. Taking accountability of things that, all things that happen in our life. Mm-hmm. Right. That's the hardest part, because it could be something small that we did that made something big happen. But it's easier to blame that big thing on somebody else. Yep. Somebody else or something else and not looking at ourselves internally. Well, over time, I realized that my actions and emotions played a major part in the day I was shot. You know, and so when people look at, you know, it was easy for me to tell people I walked back to my car and I was shot because that's actually what happened. Sure. I didn't know this, man. I didn't know anything. I literally didn't even see him before I was shot. Right. But 30 minutes prior was when I pulled up to that scene. So what transpired in that 30 minutes now for those first three years, I wasn't. Oh, it was his fault. (laughs) 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 Right. Like uh, for the first three years, it was. Yeah. 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 and, And until I started to understand that I played a part in it, too. Sure. And so, so when, you know, so my point is that when I had an initial interview with the people on Queer Eye, man, we're talking about my story. It got to that point of me taking accountability, following up with, he gave me life when he tried to take it. And so the producer I had was like, um, whoa, Wes, like that's powerful. And it was a black woman from Delaware, you know? Mm-hmm. And so she understood that the story that I was sharing with her, you know, you, when you hear someone like myself coming from a community where there's so much hate and negativity and you see this positivity being poured out, she's like, hit me with one question. Like, well, you know, you know, true forgiveness ain't true forgiveness unless you can face the person. And I'm like, oh, you know, like this is nobody has ever taught me forgiveness. Wow. Nobody has ever taught me to actually let something go. I have been around a community of people my whole life of so much negativity and blaming the next person that I didn't understand what forgiveness was. And so in that in that process of conversating, you know, we're of course it's rushed, right? Because we're like, well, can you do this? Can you do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And <laughs> she's like, you know, I'm like, well, let's do it then. Right. So I didn't even think twice about it. I was more like, Let's do it. And they're like, whoa, you sure? And I'm like, yeah. And of course, my city is pretty small. Of course, mm-hmm. like as a black man being shot, I pro- I knew who shot me when I woke up. Like sure. there's a retaliation kind of uh, stigma that goes on in our community. So I was already kind of like on the forefront of things. And so I was like, oh, well, I have some information I can share with you, like, you know, Facebook page or whatever that you could go reach out. Sure. I didn't know what day, though. Oh. So I didn't know okay. that. Okay, so I didn't know what day. Now I felt it. So now let me tell you about this day. And I'm gonna tell you the power of knowing that you have to be the change that you wish to see in the world, but also understanding that your body is a vessel and that you're moving through energy. And so the the ability to move through and understand that the body is a vessel, you don't care about the damage that's harmed to it as long as you're putting the right things out into the world. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was like, I already had the fear that something was gonna happen because of my city, because of like just the the stigma, right? Like I don't care if it's cameras around, if you really want somebody. Sure. Right. You know what I mean, sure. like that's just my community. That's just the, that's how it happened. Right. So for me, it was like I was nervous, but also, like I said, I wasn't aware. So that this Thursday morning, I woke up. I got a call from my father. My my one of my favorite cousins had died. He was Oof. he died that morning. Um, and it was just health complications. He had diabetes real bad, but mm-hmm. it was like always with me from those three years. So oh, wow. for me, it was really, really tough because like, as I got better, you know how you like, oh, I should have been there, you know? So I had all these, you know, 
So then that same day was the day I cut my hair with John. Oh, wow. Right. So I wake up, then we got to go to the barbershop. So now that's hard because that was the last day I had my hair cut, you know, yep. seven years ago. So you can see it on your face when, when that first lock. <laughs> <got cut. laughs> and I was like, Oh my God. So then, all right. So now all that has happened. So, you know, come the afternoon, I'm literally now like grieving. I never had time to grieve, nor could I really share with people on, on um, on the scene on the stage because i felt like that was going to cause some issues yeah so i text uh one of the producers when me and karamo got in the car so when me, when me and karamo got in that truck and he started asking questions i'm like oh it was, we about to really you know this wow i'm we about to go meet this dude i just felt it and i'm like so we pull up to a coffee shop and i text the producer like i cannot do this like I lost my cousin, like my emotions is bothering me. Like, and you know, producer said, you know, Wes, go back and pray, you know, go to, you know, get out, go pray, you know, that. And I'm like, you know, for me, like I am, I'm a heavy faith based person, mm -hmm. you know, but I was like, man, you know, and my mom I'm like, what is prayer going to do if, you know, like, I don't know, you're like, I'm really hurt. Right. So yeah. I went back and I did something different. You know, I, I believe that in life, like we are always faced with an obstacle before we can challenge our own greatness. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that obstacle is challenging us. And so for me, the death of my cousin was a, a huge obstacle knowing that I was about to do something that hadn't been seen in the world on TV two black men being able to face each other to talk about the differences that change the trajectory of one person's life and probably change something of the others as well right Definitely. and be able to figure it out right like you don't see that so i went to the back in uh this coffee shop and i just said i prayed and i talked to my cousin i said you know what i don't know why you left today but i feel like i'm about to do something that you know had never been done before and i need you mm. and so when and so you know as people see in the show I rode in and it was like my face was real tense, right? Yeah. Until I felt the angels around me. That's amazing. You know what I mean? Until I felt that I knew that I was comfortable and I was safe. Mm -hmm. I had broke the I had broke that chain of fear by rolling in two. In mm -hmm. a moment I was facing that man, it didn't I didn't care no more than to I didn't even care about what he was going to say. I really yeah. just wanted to tell him how amazing my life was because of him. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and and so, of course, he shares why, right? As yeah. I asked, like, why did you do this? Well, by that time, because I had took accountability, because I understood the things that happened, and then because I had much more of an open mind and a clear mind, I also understood his perception right. or his perspective on right. why he did what he did and that gave me the ability to not see anything wrong with that but to also give him healing because in my seven years by that time i met him i was healed and i had done amazing things to help heal others and he needed to understand that yes my life might have changed forever but that's nothing i'm upset about not when i'm literally sitting there helping like even if my life changed and you gave me the ability to help one person you gave me that strength to do something I wouldn't have did if I was still walking. And that's how I knew that that plan that was always set for me. We always have people that come into our lives and he was just somebody too. You know, I had a lifestyle that I was following that I had a lot of close encounters, but I was too hard headed because I couldn't see past that. Mm -hmm. You know, and I believe like, you know, all my near death experiences, cause there were a few living in the streets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Being shot was like, listen, you got a bigger plan, but I need to sit you down because you not listening. And like, so for me, when I started to look at it from that point and realize that we all have some, we, ha we all have a duty in this world to inspire someone else. Yeah, to amen. give back to someone else like and there's one thing that i heard was that you know the moment that you take the things that you're passionate about and you serve others with your passion it creates your purpose and you so look at me it's like fitness and nutrition became my passion which i serve others through that by disabled but not really and now i'm living my purpose by doing it every day without having to feel like it's you know like i'm pressured yeah. I'm moving with love. I'm moving with empathy, but it all happened, you know, through this whole journey. Right. And so when I got the chance to face Maurice, I was forgiving myself. 
Mm -hmm. I wasn't forgiving him. I was thanking him, but I was forgiving me for even blaming him for the actions that took place that caused me to us to be in that position. It's you amazing. know what I mean? And, and yeah, and that is I think that is where society fails is us having the ability to take that accountability. Yep. Because that's what it takes for us to move on into this world the right way. And you're, I just wanted to show that. You're an amazing man, my friend. The 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 idea that, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'm paraphrasing here, of course, but if we all took a bit more accountability for ourselves, uh, I think the world would be a bit better place, don't you think? Yeah. I've never, I've never seen one person um, or one anything that you know wasn't free if they didn't take accountability. Yeah, totally, totally, right. totally. Like, period. You it's know? amazing. I mean, that that's such a powerful statement, and and I I really want to thank you for your time. And you know, as we kind of wrap up, I I always I always kind of ask the last question in a similar vein, which is kind of you know given all the lessons you've learned and the things you've been through, you know, if you were sitting one-on-one -on -one with anybody in the world, you know, what, what would you tell them about how to move forward in the world? Oh man, you know what? I love that. You know, I'm always pumped for those good things, right? Those good things. Um, the best thing to do is to find yourself is to be able to face your reflection and be okay with that person that you see and be willing to uh, be change that person. If you've, if you believe that that's something that's destined, right? But in order to move through this world, you have to be true to yourself. You have to believe in yourself and love yourself and don't focus on the opinions of others because with that full acceptance, everything that you need, every all the people that you will want around you will gravitate because of the energy that you push out. The other thing is that you have to speak affirmations. I'm a firm believer of affirmations Me and too. I think that everybody should have them. There's there's a few that I, I want to share. Um, sure. I always have my affirmation journal with me. I love it. And uh, the very first one, because I believe that this is, I heard it maybe four weeks ago. It wasn't that mm -hmm. long ago. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness allows us to see that those who harmed us are human. Oof. That's amazing. <laughs> that was, for me, hearing that and understanding that my process and just what I explained, mm -hmm. we're all human and we all make mistakes, but that doesn't mean that we're held, should be held accountable for our mistakes our whole life. If we can hold ourselves accountable of that mistake and now be better from it. That's amazing. You know, so now here's my other one though. I have uh -huh. abilities that no one else has and I will use them to make the world a better place. My voice matters, my belief matter. If only I would change my thoughts, I can change the world. I deserve to take up space. Happy, happiness, laughter, peace, and wealth surround me because I am worthy. My success and failures are in my hands. I love myself unconditionally. And every day I am becoming a better version of myself. And my last one, uh -huh. happy is a choice. And today I choose to be happy. Everyone has a choice that they can make in this world to push themselves to be the person that they believe that they want to be. Mm -hmm. But it starts within and it starts with you being able to push out and give yourself all the fruits and, 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 and birds that you need so that you can know that you're the beautiful flower that you're looking for. That's unbelievable. I don't even know what to say. I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, I want to listen. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to post uh, information below, uh, you know, social media stuff, the way to get in touch with disabled, but not really. And look, I challenge everybody who's watching this today. Look, if you were inspired by what Wesley said, please go to the Facebook page and donate. It doesn't matter what you donate. Every little bit counts to help him do the good works that he's doing. And so if you've enjoyed this and some of the other interviews on this channel, please don't forget to subscribe and click the notification button. And Wesley, here's what I always end my interviews with. You ready? Remember, life speaks to you. And if you think it doesn't, you're not listening. Hey, I love it. You like that? <laughs> Amen. Thanks, Wesley. Take care. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye.